All right, let's do some examples. So here are two functions, f of x equals 7x squared plus 1, and g of t equals square root t plus 7. So I want you to not just mechanically do the problem, but also in your head explain what it means, how to compute it, and how to read. There are lots of studies that show if you learn how to read and write correct mathematics that you will process it correctly. And again, remember, if you are starting to panic, just breathe, stay focused, do one thing at a time. So go ahead, pause the video here, and only after you have completed all the problems A through I, then we will discuss it together. I am not there. I know I cannot see what you're doing, but I know what some of you might be thinking. You're like, oh my God, so many problems. If you are reacting like that, hide all the problems and just uncover one at a time and then solve the problems one at a time. You can do this. Remember, we've processed what the function value means. You're replacing all x values or all the t values, depending on which function you're working with, with whatever the input happens to be. So go ahead and pause the video here and see what you can do. Assuming you've come back, let's take a look and see if my answers match your answers. So if you can see here f of 4, replace x with 4 in the f function, Remember, f is the name of the function, 4 is the input. And the output would be 7 times 4 squared plus 1, which will give you 7 times 16 plus 1, or 113. In f of a plus h, instead of 4, we are going to substitute a plus h. So you have 7 times a plus h bracket squared plus 1. You can multiply the a plus h out a plus h times a plus h and have further simplification. But right now, we're just concerned about evaluating functions. You don't have to simplify that any further. So f of negative 2, similarly, you will replace negative 2 for x in the f function and compute it and you get 7 times 4 plus 1 or 29. All right, let's take a look at g. The input for g in the original function is t, and now you have g of a plus 1, so you would replace the t with a plus 1, giving you square root a plus 1 plus 7. g of 4, replace the t with a 4, you'll have square root of 4 plus 7, square root of 4 is 2, 2 plus 7 is 9. Now in the next one, it's interesting. You have f of 3 plus g of a. Remember, we are not panicking one thing at a time. So we're going to cover the f of 3. Just do that part first, which will give you 7 times 3 squared plus 1. And then uncover the plus. So then you have a plus, And then you have a g of a, which is square root a plus 7. And remember, you can only add like terms. So 9 times 7, 63 plus 1, and then square root a plus 7. 63 and 1 is 64, 64 and 7 is 71, plus square root a. Those are unlike terms, so they would have to stay. All right, let's take a look at what you came up with f of wiggy jiggy. Wiggy jiggy is really nothing. It's just a made up word that I made up. And the reason for that is to see if you can process what to do when you have to evaluate f of something you have not seen before. So if you did not attempt that, because it says you have to do those on your own, please go ahead, pause the video here, and see what you can write. Good. Very good. At least you tried, even if you did not get it right. We have 7 wiggy jiggy squared plus 1. The reason to make up words like that or evaluate things you haven't seen before is to prepare your mind to become used to unseen quantities 
so you understand the process and not just do it mechanically. And then f of 1 would equal 7 times 1 squared, or 7 plus 1. Do you remember what it means? It's always good to pause, even if you can evaluate functions, to understand what does this mean. f is the name of the function, 1 is the input, 8 is the output, and the coordinate x, 1, and y, 8 is a point on the graph or on the visual graphical representation of the function f of x equals 7x squared plus 1. All right, what'd you come up with? The next one. So pause the video here, and actually, even though I'm not there, speak it out loud as if I could hear it. How you would read that last problem and what your answer was. Even if there's nobody in the room, speak it out loud, and we'll see what answer you got. Go ahead. All right, so what did you say? Did you say g of a plus b equals square root of a plus b plus 7? If you did not get that answer, you may want to go back and make sure you understand the concept of what it means to evaluate a function. Remember, grit, hard work, and persistence is one way to master and get yourself to understand the topics. All right, in this example, you are given a function, and you're asked to find domain and range, and then also f of 2, f of 1, f of negative 3, and also for what x values do you get f of x equals 1. So go ahead, pause the video here, do the problem on your own, and then we'll come back and discuss it together. Again, don't just sit there and wait for me to do it for you. Please pause the video here, attempt it on your own, and then we will discuss it together. Assuming you've come back, let's look at the solution. So domain is all the x coordinates, range is all the y coordinates. So domain, look at your graph. What does it span? What x coordinates does it span? That's the domain. What y coordinates does it span? That's the range. So we can just list all the x coordinates for which there are points that you see on the graph. So negative 3, negative 2, 0, 1, 2, and 4. For range, all the y coordinates. So that would be negative 4, 1, 2, 4, and 6. All right, let's take a look at f of 2. You can see f of 2 is going to be 4 because from the graph, follow the x coordinate of 2, y coordinate is 4. When x coordinate is 1, y coordinate is also 4. So both f of 2 and f of 1 have y coordinate of 4 or output to be 4 or function value to be 4. f of negative 3, function value at negative 3. So take a look at x equals negative 3, y coordinate is 2, so function value of negative 3 is 2. Now you're asked, for what x values is f of x equal to 1? So that means the y coordinate is 1, and you are looking for the x coordinate. So you're going the other direction. So y coordinate 1, and follow left, there is no points on the left. But on the right, you get x equals 4. So you can see that we have x can be 4. If I give you a similar question and ask you for which x coordinates do you get y coordinate 4, then you'll have two answers because, as you saw, x equals 1 and 2 both give you the answer of 4. So it's very important to understand, are you asking for x coordinate or y coordinate? input or output, and that will allow you to do problems of this type. All right, let's see what you can do with this function. Again, be very careful what dependent and independent variables you're working with. Here, the independent variable is t, and the dependent variable is y. y is dependent on t, and they're related with the function arc of t. You can see how in this case, the function name is not just one letter, but it's a word arc, and then t is the left-right movement, 
Why is the up-down movement? Be careful in how you answer the questions then. Go ahead, pause the video here, find domain and range, and then answer the questions. We'll give you a few moments. When you're ready, when you're done with the problem, resume the video to check if you got the right answers. All right, so what you got? Well, you can see that domain is the span, left-right span of the graph, and the range is the up-down span of the graph. This graph, the function is not discrete. Discrete means separate points, but it is actually a curve. So the left-right span, which in this case is the t-axis, the graph spans from negative 2 to 2, including negative 2 and 2. So the domain in the interval notation would be square bracket, negative 2 comma 2 square bracket to close it off. And that tells you it's all the t coordinates that are between negative 2 and 2. For the range, you're looking for the up-down span of the graph, which in this case, the y coordinate spans from 0 all the way to 3. And so your range would be 0 to 3, closed interval. Closed means the endpoints are included. All right, let's take a look and see what arc of 0 would be. Arc of 0, so that means your t coordinate is 0. So you're looking at the y-intercept. Remember, y-intercept simply means what? It means the coordinate in where the graph intersects the y-axis. So in this case, arc of 0 is 3. Arc of 2, so when t coordinate is 2, your y coordinate is 0. When your t coordinate is negative 2, y coordinate is 0. So 2 and negative 2 are your t intercepts. Intercepts means places where it hits the t axis. For what values of t is arc of t 0? So now you're looking at the y coordinate is 0, and what are the t coordinates? In other words, t intercepts which you already saw were negative 2 and 2, so you already answered that. So your answers to that would be t equals 2 or negative 2. You can see here multiple t values produce the same y coordinate like the ones we just saw, negative 2 and 2, but there are many others. However, this relation is a function because every single t value is producing only one y output. Look at this relation between p and t. In this relation, p is not a function of t. And because you can see how several t values do produce the same p coordinate, however, one t coordinate produces more than one p coordinate. So for every input of t, you do not have a unique output of p, which makes p not a function of t. So one observation we can make from previous example to this example is that in order for a relation to be a function, and if you have a graph of it, all you have to do is look at a vertical line. If a vertical line intersects the graph of the relation in two points, what that means is that for that particular t coordinate or x coordinate, depending on whichever your independent variable happens to be, you are encountering two output values, which would make it not a function because for a function, every input should produce a unique output. So we just figured out how to determine if you're given a graph whether a relation is a function or not, and that is the vertical line test. So in a relation, y is a function of x if and only if a vertical line intersects this graph in no more than one point. So let's do a couple examples and you determine whether the relations are functions or not. Let's look at the relation x squared plus y squared equals 9, which is a circle of radius 
3 centered at 0, 0. Determine if y is a function of x. Go ahead. Pause the video here, and you do the problem. Assuming you've come back, you can see that a vertical line here intersects in more than one point at x equals 1, for example, and many other points, x equals 2. So if there is even one x-coordinate for which there are two y-coordinates as an output, automatically your relation is not a function of x. All right, so take a look at the relation y equals 1 quarter x plus 3 bracket squared times x minus 1 bracket squared. Determine if in this relation y is a function of x. Go ahead, see what you can do. Pause the video here, and then we'll come back together. You can see that in this case, every single vertical line intersects the graph in exactly one point. So that means y is a function of x here. Relations and functions have lots of practical applications in physics, chemistry, biology, many STEM disciplines, and other disciplines. Let's take an example. Suppose somebody throws a ball from five feet high. What happens to it? It doesn't just keep on going up and up and up. What happens? The gravity will make it come back down. So let's take a look at this scenario. So you have a person, so ball is at five feet high, and it's thrown into the sky, and it's going to keep on going up and up and up. Eventually, it will come back down, reach a maximum height, and come back down. So in order to demonstrate this relationship between the height of the ball and the time elapsed, this makes it a function. You can see that. If you connect it, it becomes an upside-down parabola. So this next example will deal with exactly this kind of scenario. So in this next problem, see what you can do. Go ahead. The height of a ball above the ground in feet is given by h of t equals 5 plus 64t minus 16t squared, where t is number of seconds after the ball is thrown. So the graph is given to you below. Go ahead and compute the values of the function at the given values of t. And then when you are finished, explain the physical significance of the values you've computed. In other words, what does it mean when you actually compute the function values in this case? So pause the video here, see what you can do. So if you take our function, you can see that the ball, once it hits the ground, that's the end of that function. So even though you can have any value for t, you cannot have negative values because it's time. So our domain here is restricted to 0 to 4.0767. You can see from the graph if you zoom in. The range is going to be 0 to 69 because that's the maximum height that it reaches. And you can just play with, use any graphing utility like Desmos or GeoGebra, plot the function, and trace it. And you can see where the maximum is and where the approximate value where it hits the ground is. So when you're computing h of 0, you will end up with 5 plus 64 times 0 minus 16 times 0 squared, which gives you 5, which makes sense. That's the starting point for when the person was throwing the ball. Once it's 1 second after, you put 1 in for t, and you get 53. And always remember what it means, 53 feet. h of 2 is 69, which means that the maximum height reached after 2 seconds is 69 feet. So you can continue checking for yourself that you have the right answers. Go ahead, plug it in, and then verify that you have the same answers as what I have here. Please remember to put feet after all of your answers because the h values are measured in feet. All right, let's look at this next example. See this function? It's broken. It's into pieces. But such a function is called a piecewise function. So when it's given to you in a broken form like that, you have to be careful 
which piece you are looking at, that will depend on which x value you're looking at. So in this case, you're looking for p of negative 5. So locate x equals negative 5, go up, and you'll see that that's 5. So p of negative 5 would be 5. What about p of 6? So you locate 6 on the x-axis, go up to the graph, and that gives you p of 6 to be 2. What about p of negative 3? Again, locate negative 3, and you can see it's 5 again. What about p of 0? You'll say, wait a minute. What about p of 0? p of 0 you cannot have because it's not in the domain. So you can say it does not exist. And why is that? Because 0 is not in the domain. So what is the domain and range of this function? So go ahead, you spend a little time doing domain and range of this function. So domain would be closed interval negative 6 to negative 2, and 2 to 7, 7 not included, and range would be 5 and 2. So far we've played with functions of one variable. So now we'll look at functions of multiple variables, because in many different applications you will see this. To plot functions, of one or two variables, you can use Desmos or GeoGebra or GeoGebra 3D. And so, for example, s of xy equals x squared plus y squared, and you want to evaluate s of all these different things. So remember, evaluating a function at a particular point or a particular input means substitute those variables with the inputs that we are asked of. So the first one, s of negative 2 comma 3, substitute x equals negative 2, and substitute y equals 3 into the formula x squared plus y squared to get your answers. So go ahead and play with this. But before you do that, if you are curious, we can plot this in GeoGebra 3D so you can actually see how the function looks like. So instead of a curve, you will end up with a surface. So the graph here is going to be a surface. So x squared plus y squared, when x and y are 0, you can see it's going to be uh, 0, 0, 0. And then you can plot a few other points. And you can see clearly, because you have x squared plus y squared, there is no graph below the plane. So everything is above the xy plane because you have the z coordinate positive. And whenever you have a positive number, equals x squared plus y squared is circles. So it's going to be circles uh, in cross sections, which get bigger and bigger as you go higher. So we expect the shape to be something like this. The nice part about playing with online programs, GeoGebra 3D, this that's what I'm plotting this on, is that you can actually turn and look at how the surface looks like from different directions. So it might be important for you to play with it and uh, by yourself and plot many different kind of functions if you're curious how these surfaces look like. All right, let's go back to our problem here. All right, so pause the video here and play with this function and see what answers you get. Go ahead, pause the video here, and then we will come back together to discuss and see what you got. Go ahead. Just give it a try. It's OK if you get things wrong, remember? Trying is very important because when you try, we can see what is going on. I'm going to wait here until you're done. So you might want to pause the video and then come back. All right, assuming that you have come back, let's discuss the solution. Let's start out with the domain. Normally, in a one variable function, our domains were either intervals on the x-axis or points. But here, the domain, because there are two variables going in, it could be a region or points in the xy plane. So sometimes people say it's the two-dimensional Euclidean space for the domain. And the notation for that is r with a 2 on its head as an exponent, which is r cross r or r squared. The range of 
our function, which is the output, because it's x squared plus y squared, that means that we're never going to get negative numbers. The smallest it can be is 0 and everything above it. So 0 to infinity would be our range. Let's talk about s of negative 2 comma 3. So plug in negative 2 for x and 3 for y and then solve. And then you continue down the line like that. So check if you got the right answers. When you are computing s of a plus h, b plus k, you are substituting a plus h for x, b plus k for y. Similarly, in the next one, x plus 2 instead of x, and y minus 2 instead of y, square root x plus 2 instead of x, and y squared minus 3 instead of y. So it's a substitution. You're just taking things and substituting it back. So really, Functions of one variable, two variables, three variables don't really behave that differently. Really just evaluating means plugging the numbers in for inputs and then figuring out what the output will be. So continue working with more examples in the textbook.